Okay, so what is natural selection anyway? Right? What is it based on? What is it? What's it about? What does it say? Okay. Um, natural selection is based on some very fundamental principles that are absolutely observable. Okay. Um, so let's go through those. Okay. So one of the observations, right, that leads us to natural selection is overproduction. So all species tend to produce excessive numbers of offspring. What do I mean by excessive? Um, all organisms produce more babies than will survive. Okay, offspring is, is the technical term for, you know, the next generation, right? Um, offspring. So the picture I chose to show you here is a kiwi, right? If you've ever eaten a kiwi, you know there's a bazillion seeds inside of every kiwi. Well, seeds fundamentally are baby plants, right? And so if not all of those seeds are going to become a kiwi tree, right? Even if you tried to plant them, not all of them would turn into a kiwi tree, okay? Um, so that's overproduction, okay? So one of the, you know, impacts of this overproduction is competition, right? So um, individual organisms are competing for limited resources, right? And so if there are more individuals produced, then are going to survive, right? Um, they will compete with each other for resources, whether those resources are food or space or water or sunlight or whatever, okay? So overproduction and competition, okay? Here's a fun picture of uh, spores. Um, this is a particular type of fungus. Um, it, fungi are like pros at this. They make millions and millions and millions of spores. It's like, it's crazy, right? And so, right, this is another example of overproduction. If every single one of those spores became a fungus, it, in one generation, the earth would be completely covered with this particular species of fungus, right? So overproduction is a thing, right? It is a thing that happens in, you know, basically all species, okay? All right. Another observation is that there is variation among individuals, right? So um, variation exists among individuals in a population. So this happens to be um, an example with ball pythons. Ball pythons are a fun, they're a great pet snake because they're chill. Um, they're not huge. They're pretty easy to take care of. They are picky eaters though, which is kind of a pain in the butt, but, but they're pretty chill. Um, species of snake if you're interested in a snake as a pet um, and they're called ball pythons because they tend to curl up in a ball that's like in nature that's where they what they do they curl up into like a ball and they kind of hang over a branch right so they're so they call them ball pythons because they curl up um, and so the, here's a couple different you know examples of ball pythons and so there's a lot of variation in their appearance right um, but in other aspects as well okay um, much certainly not all, but much of that variation is heritable, meaning um, that it's genetic, right? And so we haven't talked about what a gene is yet. We haven't talked about what DNA is yet. That's okay, right? But the idea that much of the variation that exists within individuals is something that is inherited, okay? Um, and so when we learn about DNA and about genes, right, we'll talk about the more detailed mechanisms of that. Okay, but there it is. Um, one other term that I want to make sure you're familiar with is a population. So the term population um, has a very specific meaning in biology. A population is a group of individuals of the same species. that interact, okay? So you'll see other definitions, you know, but that's kind of a good basic one. Um, and I'm taking the time to talk about this because it's gonna become important in a few minutes, okay? So population, the term population means a group of individuals of the same species um, that interact with each other, okay? All right, let's keep on going here. So here's some more 
variation, right? So there's, and this is just visual, right? There's also um, variation in behaviors and variations in physiology and variations in any possible thing that you could, you know, think about, right? The speed of growth, I, you know, whatever, right? This just, we're showing you some examples that are very visual so that you can easily see them and appreciate them. Okay, so natural selection is basically the idea of, let's take all of those observations and put them together, okay? So if you have overproduction, which leads to competition, and you also have variation, much of which is inherited, then what's gonna end up happening? Right? Well, if not everybody can survive, some individuals aren't going to make it. Okay? If not everybody can survive because there's more than you need, more than you need, more than you know, there's resources for. Okay? Um, and there's a lot of variation within those individuals, then we're going to end up with competition. And some of that's going to be based on you know, how well suited you are to your. Um, environment okay and that's fundamentally what natural selection is okay so the the three word short definition of natural selection is unequal reproductive success right so if the characteristics that you have your brand of that variation right um makes you well suited to live in a particular area right at a particular time um and those traits that you possess are inherited you're more likely to have more offspring, which also have those traits, and they will also be more successful, so on and so forth, okay? So unequal reproductive success is like the short, cheesy <laughs> um, definition of natural selection. A better definition is um, those individuals with traits best suited for the local environment will produce more offspring, okay? That's fundamentally what natural selection is. Okay. Um, one really, imp really important thing to realize about natural selection is natural selection is a, is a process of editing, not a creative process. So what do I mean by that? Um, fundamentally, um, natural selection doesn't make new characteristics. Natural selection only selects, with the air quotes, um, characteristics that already exist, okay? So this is an important idea. Where do those, where do new traits come from then? Mm, we'll think about that a little bit, okay? Um, another really important thing to realize about natural selection is that it's timely and it's regional, okay? So one of the areas where people um, sort of get the wrong idea about natural selection is they think that there's some best right? There is some, and that everything is, is evolving towards the best version of that, okay? Um, well, what is best totally depends on a variety of things, right? And so what is best now might not be the best in the future and might not be the best in the past, right? What is best in one location might not be best in another location, right? So we're gonna talk about examples of all of these things, right? If you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't worry, we'll get to examples of all of those, okay? And so there's my little note to, to remind us that if natural selection doesn't create new traits, then what does create new traits? And so I'm gonna let you think, about, I'm gonna let you stew about that for a minute, okay? We'll answer the question, right? But I'm gonna let you, I'm just gonna let you sit for a minute with that, okay? All right, so this is sort of like the classic, you know, example of natural selection that you, you know, learn about the, the peppered moths are the, you know, the story that everybody tells. And if you're like, I don't know what a peppered moth is, don't worry about it. Um, so let's say we have a population of insects, okay? Um, and so we have this population of insects and they come in a wide range of colors and they live in a habitat that's very dark, right? So that's what the black background represents. All right, so there is our population that has varied inherited traits. So their color pattern of these little beetles, right, um, is um, inherited. It's genetic basis. Um, and so we have a, a variety here. Well, beetles are tasty. If you're a bird, you want to eat them because that's what you eat. Okay, and so um, some of these beetles are going to be better suited 
for their environment than others because you know they can avoid being eaten at least maybe a little bit better than others right so the lighter colored beetles tend to be easier for the predator the bird to find right and so those individuals that have that trait are going to be eliminated from the population okay so there's our bird continuing to eat the light colored ones right and so the individual beetles will reproduce as as all organisms do right and what you'll see over time is fewer and fewer and fewer of the beetles in that population right will have that light color right because they the ones that have that light color are at a huge disadvantage and they're more likely to die young right they're they're less likely to reach adulthood and have offspring as the ones that are darker and match the habitat now would this be different in a habitat where it was lighter colored absolutely right it would in fact be perhaps the opposite right so if this same population of beetles was found in a different area with a light colored habitat what would you expect to happen there all right well maybe the lighter colored ones would you know have an advantage over the dark colored ones and the dark colored ones would be easier for the birds to find so the dark colored ones would disappear and the light colored ones would become more abundant okay so you know this is showing you what natural selection is in a very sort of simplistic kind of a way one thing i want you to know to realize about this is i want you to realize that um you know so this is that regional issue right of like you know what's best or what's better depends on where you live and when you're living there right the other thing that this kind of starts to get us thinking about is it starts to get us thinking about what actually is evolving when we're talking about natural selection so when we're talking about natural selection we are talking about a population evolving over time we are not talking about individuals evolving okay so let's back up a step and just talk about that word evolution so the word evolution means if you look it up in the dictionary right in sort of in a general non-biological context but just kind of a you know english language context evolution means change okay um so in a when we're talking about natural selection right we're not talking about individuals changing, right? So as an individual, you can absolutely evolve, right? You change over time, right? You change based on what you're learning. You change based on your experiences. Your body changes over time, right? So as individuals, you evolve, but natural selection, that type of evolution, works on populations not on individuals okay so natural selection doesn't change whether or not an individual is light or dark in this example right it changes how many individuals in the population have you know light body color versus dark color body color or whatever okay so natural selection works on populations so let's go back and think about what population means again okay so i'm you know think about it all right so this is a little graphic a little infographic that kind of summarizes what we've been talking about all right so um when these three conditions are satisfied the population's allele frequencies change what the heck is an allele frequency you don't know that yet but that's okay um we'll get to that we're not even gonna we'll, we'll get to that in a minute okay all right so there we go there's some there's another graphic that kind of I'm not going to go through it because I think I kind of explained it well, but there's another graphic if you, if it helps. Okay. Um, now the results of natural selection can be extraordinarily adaptive, right? And so what you're looking at in this picture is you are looking at three different um, mantids. So like a praying mantis, right? If you've ever seen a praying mantis, we had a great one in our yard the other day and I had to rescue it from the dogs. The dogs were trying to eat it and they got one of its, you know, front legs. And anyway, I rescued it and put it in a tree and then it got back down on the ground because it's stupid. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So mantids are actually a tremendously diverse type of insect and they're, they're, they can be 
incredibly beautiful. Um, and many of them are amazing mimics. Okay. So, right. This particular species that lives in Trinidad looks quite a bit like a dead leaf. This particular one looks quite a bit like a green leaf. And this guy, super cute from Malaysia, right? Look at that beautiful thing, right? They live on orchids. And so they look very much, in fact, you might be having a hard time kind of seeing where are its legs exactly. So where did I put my, did I lose my pen? No, I always do this. I'm so, right, so here's one leg. Here's another leg. Here's another leg. And then there's that leg on that side. There's a leg on that right so they just like blend in so well to their um to their environment which is which is pretty cool okay so natural selection can be very adaptive because if you're living on this tree in trinidad being green would be right that wouldn't be the that wouldn't be the goodness right being brown yeah. So this idea that natural, even within a similar species, even within species that are similar to each other, right? Within a similar group of organisms, right? Evolution, natural selection specifically is, um, is regional, right? It depends on where you live. Okay. Uh, a little bit about populations. I think we kind of already talked about that. So um, squirrel A and squirrel B, for example, let's kind of, let's, let's think about this idea of a population, right? So remember, a population is a group of individuals that interact with each other. So squirrels are not great swimmers. <laughs> so do we think that squirrel A and squirrel B are likely in the same population? They could very well be the same species, but they're probably not in the same population, right? Because they're not going to interact with each other. Right, the chances of squirrel A and squirrel B meeting each other and you know raising a family of baby squirrels together is highly unlikely, <laughs> right? So we would consider them to be in separate populations, right? How about our fish there? Well, um, you know they're all in the same body of water. So even though you know we find one fish in this area and one fish in that area, you know. They look like they're probably pretty good swimmers. I bet they could totally interact with each other. So they're probably in the same population, right? And then our birds, you know, that's another one that's like, a, I don't know, maybe, right? Maybe they're in the same population because birds can, can fly. Now, how much they choose to fly, um, how strong they are at flying depends. So some birds only have a really, really narrow range of where they live, whereas other birds, you know, travel incredibly far distances. So you know, so that one's kind of a maybe, maybe not, but, you know, definitely squirrel A and squirrel B, not the same population, whereas fish A and fish B are probably in the same population. So just a little bit of kind of clarification about populations. Um, another term that we need to talk about is we need to talk about the gene pool. So one of the things that we um, have been talking about is um, the fact that natural selection acts on populations, right? And so um, a population is what's changing over time, okay? The term gene pool describes all of the traits, right? Genes, essentially, in a population. So one of the things we can talk about is we can say that natural selection um, often results in changes in the gene pool, okay? So gene pool is like, instead of looking at all the different individual organisms within a population, right? It looks at all of the genes of all of the individuals in that population, okay? So it's kind of another way of looking at, um, at natural selection, okay? Um, there's another little graphic. Like I said, I, you know, I think we've explained it pretty well, but, you know, check it out. Gene pool, gene pool changing over time. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to go through some other examples of natural selection, but before I forget, there's one other thing that I really want to talk about. Okay. Um, I want to spend a minute talking about, can I, I don't, I've never tried to do this before. I don't know if I can do it. Mm. Oh, let's turn that off. Okay. Um, so another thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about something called Darwinian. I don't want to talk about it here. I want to do it here. Sorry. I pushed something. 
Darwinian fitness. Okay, so we're right a definition there, but before we do that, you may have noticed that I conspicuously did not say a phrase. So many of you, when you think of natural selection, what you think of is you think survival of the fittest. That's what you think of. Um, which isn't the worst thing ever, but it is absolutely not the way to describe natural selection. And even though it's like, but everybody does. Let me explain to you why it's not. Okay, so when we talk about fitness in an evolutionary sense, what we're talking about is we're talking about um, an individual's contribution to the future gene pool. Okay, so what, what in the heck does that even mean? That is so weird. All right, so what is fitness? Um, what is Darwinian fitness? Darwinian fitness is all about contribution to the gene pool of your population over time, okay? So it's measured on a scale of zero to one. Um, and, you know, without getting too technical, if um, an individual has a Darwinian fitness of one, what that means is that compared to other individuals in that population, that individual has the um, greatest number of offspring, okay? So if we were all sitting in class together, I would be like, okay, let's figure out who in this room has the greatest Darwinian fitness, right? And so remember what we're looking for is we're looking for who has the greatest sort of impact on the future generation as far as sending their genes forward, okay? So the easy way of looking at that is how many offspring do you have? How many babies do you have? So um, I have two. Some of you have more than me, right? So some of you in your videos, you know, have four kids, or, you know, three kids, four kids, right? So I obviously do not have the highest Darwinian fitness if we were all sitting in a classroom together, okay? Um, I also don't have the lowest, right? Because, you know, lowest would be somebody who is zero, right? Who has zero children. Um, it also, it's sort of more complicated than that because it also kind of, you know, we can also be talking about and then the generation after that and then the generation after that, right? So for those of you that are grandparents, yeah? So that boosts your Darwinian fitness, because that means not only have your genes gone into the next generation, but your genes have gone into the next generation after that, okay? So it's not just about how many kids you have, is what I'm saying, right? So Darwinian fitness is about the, you know, contribution to future gene pools. in your population. Pop with an apostrophe in the N is an abbreviation for population, okay? So, um, yeah, okay? So one of my nerdy biology friends who um, is a professor in Pennsylvania now, right? Um, back when we were youngsters and we were all in graduate school, um, she, came, she came to my wedding and she wrote on the little guest book, she wrote, may you have good Darwinian fitness. And at the time, my, you know, husband and I were like, oh no, we don't want to have kids. No, we want our Darwinian fitness to be zero. Um, yeah, but no, no, it did turn out in fact that we have reasonable Darwinian fitness. I don't know if you guys can hear that airplane, but ugh. Living next to an airport, it's a pain in the butt. Anyway, okay. So the reason we don't use the term survival of the fittest, let's circle back to that, is if somebody is fit, right? According to Darwinian fitness, that means that they've had a lot of offspring. And to have a lot of offspring, you have to have survived, right? If you die early in life, then you have not contributed to the future gene pool, 
right? So then, yeah. So it's almost like circular reasoning or oxymoron, right? So survival of the fittest makes you visualize like strength, right? But sometimes being the strongest isn't the advantage. Sometimes being the sneakiest is the advantage, right? Sometimes being slow is an advantage, right? Thinking of sloths. Okay. Um, sometimes being um, camouflaged is more important than being strong and fast, right? So survival of the fittest kind of gives you the wrong idea. It gives you the idea that there is one sort of best way of doing things, or it gives you the, or it doesn't explain to you what fitness actually is. Okay. So please don't use the phrase survival of the fittest because it just doesn't make any sense. It's, it's circular at best. At worst, it just doesn't, it, it's not accurate. Okay. So Darwinian fitness, an individual's Darwinian fitness is their contribution to future gene pools in their population, right? So essentially how many of your genes end up in, you know, future generations of your population. Okay. Right. Okay. So natural selection, this, I didn't mean for that to be there. <laughs> Whatever. Um, so I have a gazillion examples. I'm not going to go through all of them because I've already been talking a long time anyway. Um, but um, you can look at species and see like a variety of characteristics within ranges, right? And so this little map shows average size of a male house sparrow um, throughout the continental US, right? And if you look at it, it may remind you a little bit of like a weather map back when people read the newspaper <laughs> right you would see or and watch the weather on tv you would see these weather maps where the different you know colors met different temperatures and it's like yep it sure is the coldest right up there um and so the reason it looks a lot like a weather map is because body size is often not always but often um impacted by temperature right so it is more, it makes more sense, right, um, to be larger in a cold place. Is that making anybody think about your hot headed naked ice borers? Right? So, one of the biggest problems with that story is the idea that there is this incredibly hot critter that's super small, right? Super small things like the size of a hot-headed naked ice borer could not survive in that kind of cold, right? All of the mammals and birds that live in cold places are also pretty large, right? So emperor penguins, big. Whales, big. Seals and sea lions, big, right? Um, fur seals, big. Not sea lions so much. Those are not. Anyway, um, polar bears, big, right? So if you're living in cold place, bigger is better, generally, okay? Anyway. Um, another concept I want you to think about with natural selection is I want you to think about the speed at which natural selection occurs. So a lot of people have this, like, misconception that um, natural selection like other types of evolution is so slow that you could not possibly like, how do we even know it's happening because it's so, so slow. Um, but as it turns out, that is absolutely not true. Okay. And so this is a little diagram representing an experiment that was actually done um, by um, a man um, named Endler who um, studied guppies and was in he, he's now retired, but he was at UC Santa Barbara. So I went to UC Santa Barbara. So a lot of my classrooms were, you know, in the Endler lab, whatever, right? In that building um, named after him. So anyway, so he studied guppies and he looked at natural selection in guppies. And so what he did is he did experiments, some in the lab, some out in nature, right? Um, where he studied wild populations of guppies, um, and he was able to show that natural selection actually can occur quite rapidly um, in populations of organisms that have a fairly short lifespan, okay? Um, so what he did is he, you know, gathered, he collected a population of guppies, right? Um, and so he got a population of guppies and he split it in half. 
he put half of the guppies in a tank that had very fine sand-like gravel and he put the other half in a tank that had like big chunky gravel okay each tank also got a predator <laughs> right so there's the there's the scary predator in the corner right and so he just let them do their thing right and so guppies are are you know reach reach sexual maturity reach adulthood pretty quickly um and so it doesn't take very long for us to get through 15 generations of guppies and what he found is that after 15 generations had passed the appearance of the guppies of each population of guppies had changed quite a bit right so this population on this side right look at how they looked over time and look at this population how they looked over time right so why is that why why would they i mean it, it, we start off with guppies from the same parent population right, from the same initial population why would they have changed she takes a drink of coffee to let you think about it right so if you are a prey species if you're a guppy and there's a big predator that wants to eat cichlid that wants to eat you right um you're going to be at an advantage if you blend in with your surroundings right because your chances of living long enough to have babies right your darwinian fitness is going to be higher if you kind of blend in more with the habitat right so even in this very short period of time so can happen quickly right um 15 generations not that long in guppies right we're talking about you know a year a few months a year maybe right not very long right um you end up with um guppies in the tank that had kind of sandy gravel right looking speckled like sandy right and then in the other tank the opposite occurred right so in the tank that had like pebbly coarse you know heavy gravel right um over time the genes that were responsible for the light speckly appearance disappeared because those critters all got eaten and the ones that blended in better with their environment survived longer had a better chance of reaching maturity had a better chance of having babies had higher darwinian fitness in their habitat right so this experiment does a couple things for us it helps us appreciate the fact that natural selection is not necessarily slow in many cases it's it's fast it is definitely fast enough for us to observe in a lab definitely right depending on the organism that we're looking at um and um this also speaks to this idea of natural selection being regional so what's better depends on what your gravel looks like right that determines what's better okay all right um another example of um, natural selection happening incredibly quickly is antibiotic resistance so um in the 1940s um penicillin was was discovered um, by a guy named alexander fleming and um basically what he discovered is that um a certain type of mold called penicillium um if it was growing on a on a petri dish on a plate um no bacteria would be able to grow if there was penicillium on that plate and he thought that was really interesting and so he isolated the compound that appeared to be you know responsible for that process and penicillin was our first you know available antibiotic and at the time it was i mean people lost their minds because up until the 1940s people would die of bacterial infections all the time right you could get a bacterial infection from getting a cut and it could ultimately kill you potentially right and so people were like you know the medical community was like oh my god we have found the thing that's going to save all of us and you know it turned out that we have other problems aside from bacterial infections <laughs> we have a lot of other problems but it was a really 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 big deal okay now here's the problem with antibiotics as it turns out we've discovered 
that over time um, they become less and less effective, right? And it's not that anything has changed within the penicillin itself. What has changed is the bacteria, okay? So if you exposed Staphylococcus as a type of bacteria, if you exposed Staphylococcus to um, penicillin in the 1940s, right, we have this huge death zone, right? So most of the Staphylococcus is killed, right, a very wide distance away from where you place the penicillin, okay? Over time, that kill zone, as they call it, has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And today, very little um, of the staph is killed by penicillin, okay? So you may notice that, it, you know, so much so that um, penicillin is rarely um, prescribed anymore, right? So um, if you go on antibiotics, the chances of you going on penicillin are pretty low. Um, one, because of allergies, right? Because some people are allergic to it, but also because it's not effective against a lot of bacteria because the bacteria have become resistant. So let's look at how that happens, okay? So inside of a person, we have bacteria, okay? And one of those bacteria um, has some sort of mutation that allows it to resist whatever the you know mode of action is of that particular antibiotic, right? So that uh, that particular bacterium, you know, lives, okay, survives, right? So let's give that. So this person has a raging infection. Let's give them some antibiotics. So we give them antibiotics, right? And what that does is it kills off all of the ones that are susceptible to the antibiotic, right? So we still are, right? We're still have the antibiotic. That's what the orangey background means. So no antibiotic is pink. Antibiotic is orange, right? And so what happens over multiple generations of that bug, right, of that bacteria, is that pretty soon all of the ones that can be killed by the antibiotic die off, right? And they, you know, some survivors reproduce. But many generations later, what eventually happens is the ones that are susceptible to the antibiotic, you know, more or less disappear, right? Because they're less successful if we're using antibiotics all the time. Whereas the ones who um, can withstand the antibiotic, right, they do very well, okay? And in fact, the more they are exposed to the antibiotic, the more abundant they become because effectively their competition is being killed off, right? And so in the course of, oh God, now it's 80 years, but I, I think like it's 1990 still, like that's where my brain, is. I, my brain stopped when I was um, a teenager, apparently. It's so the mid 90s. So in my head, it's always the mid 90s. It's like 2000 still in my brain, not 2020. Anyway, okay, so, um, so, 60 years ago, no, more like, you know, 80. Um, anyway, um, our bacteria, right, the bacteria that infect us, Staphylococcus is one, um, have become resistant to antibiotics. And this is a big problem, right, because there's a lot that have, have done this, okay? A similar thing happens with pest insects and pesticides. Okay, so if the bacteria thing is sort of confusing, maybe look at this example and think about this, right? So if you have a field, right, here's a field filled with pests that are eating your crops, right, and you apply an insecticide, what you're going to do is you're going to kill the majority of them, but there might be some individuals that are a little bit resistant to that particular um, insecticide. They have some sort of mutation that allows them to resist that insecticide. They survive. And now what? Well, all their competition has died. And so now you have this field full of crops. And so they are going to be abundant. They are going to be fruitful and multiply, right? They're going to eat and eat and eat and have babies and have babies and have babies. And pretty soon you have a population where nearly everyone is resistant to that insecticide, okay? And this is something that we can easily see if you, you know, many of us don't come from an agricultural background, but 
if you did, if you came from a, you know, a long line of family farmers, right, you would know that the insecticides that your dad used are not the same insecticides that his dad used. And they're certainly not the same insecticides that his dad used because insects develop resistance to insecticide, right? And it takes on average about 10 years, okay? So we need to constantly come up with new insecticides because life finds a way, right? Anybody know where that quote is from? Life finds a way. It's one of my favorites. It's from the OG um, Jurassic Park. Not the, the new ones I like. Jurassic Park 2 and 3, by the way, terrible. If you haven't seen them, don't. You should see the old, the OG, if you haven't, right? The ones with Chris Pratt are good. He's adorable. And they're, you know, I like them. They're good. But the 2 and 3 are terrible. There's some seriously stupid crap in those. You know, some very huge biological inaccuracies that make me, anyway, okay, ah, so another example of that whole timely thing, and regional, so you can look at these, right, if you need more examples to feel better, right, maybe take the time to think about this a little bit, yeah, why, what is the deal with the finches, and their beaks, and the weather, and how do these things relate to each other, what is this about, right, Okay, so it is very important that you realize individuals don't evolve, at least not in a biological sense, right? So yes, you do as a person, right? But in a biological sense, it is not individuals who evolve. Who does evolve in a biological sense? What unit evolves? Okay. Um, this was one of the things that Lamarck, he was the, the French guy that was before, um, before Darwin. He thought that um, individuals that acquired certain characteristics would pass it off onto their offspring. And so the, the idea of that that I think is most relatable to us is this idea that, so let's say that you spend your entire life um being a bodybuilder right and lifting weights and getting getting jacked right and super super buff okay the uh, lamarck's idea with evolution is that then if you reproduce if you have babies your babies would be strong right and it's not inherited that way right because as it turns out all your muscles that you worked really hard to to grow um that that is in response to your environment right? And so that is not something that you pass on, okay? Um, so, you know, we don't have little muscle babies being born to, you know, to bodybuilders, okay? Um, the example that everybody attributes to Lamarck is the way that giraffes got long necks is because each generation stretched a little more, right? And traits don't get passed on that way. And so we'll talk more about the genetics behind that when we talk about genes, okay? Another misconception that's an issue, um, so, right, this idea that, um, I should have shown you this before I started talking about Lamarck, right? Natural selection only works with, I shouldn't cross this out because that's true, right? That's a fact, right? So it's populations evolve, right? Um, natural selection only works on heritable traits, so inherited things. It doesn't work on, um, you know, things that you acquire right? Like the example I just gave. And the last thing is evolution does not have a goal. And so we talked about this, this idea that um, there is no like perfect thing, right? Um, and what's even considered good or bad or neutral varies depending on what kind of organism we're talking about, where they live, when they live, all of that, okay? So there's not a goal in evolution, okay? So We'll wrap up natural selection, and then there's going to be one more video in this series that kind of talks about what microevolution is and all the different ways that microevolution can happen, okay? So stay tuned for that one to be a, to be a separate thing.